morning and, and those those clouds looked like snow clouds to me. Anybody else look like snow clouds to you? And in fact, Tammy looked online to see the weather report, and according to the weather report, we might get snow showers tonight. Thirty more days, remember? Was that? 30 more days. Oh, that was your prediction on Wednesday night? Yeah. yeah, for sure. Because Wednesday night, we took some informal predictions about when the first snow would be and how much it would be. Why you got that look on your face? Snow is not too calm. Okay, all right. But as long as it happens at the right time and the right way, when you can stay home and put the fire in the fireplace and you can just snuggle on the sofa, hey, that's good times for sure. But for this morning, we are here... And we are here to warm one another's hearts. We are here to worship the Lord. And we've come to gather in this place to be able to enjoy each other's company as well as God's company here in this place. So let's go ahead and pray together this morning. Then we're going to sing together. And that will get us warmed up a little bit more and such. So let's pray together for this morning. Father, we come before you right now. We thank you so much for this day. What a blessing it is, Father. It was nice being able to have that extra hour of sleep this morning and uh, the blessing that comes along with that. It's a blessing to have the cooler temperatures as well and the snow that eventually might come our way. But we pray, Father, that in the midst of it all, the changing of the seasons and everything else that comes our way, I pray that we will rest in you and trust that you are the God that never changes and that you will see us through whatever it is that we face. Father, we do already pray concerning the elections coming up Tuesday. I know that many people have already voted. Some uh, will be, uh, many will be voting on that day. And I pray, Father, your will be done. Not ours, not the political candidates necessarily, but your will be done, I pray. And we pray that here this morning, we might not be able to control what happens in our nation, although we can have an influence on it. We might not be able to control what happens in our community, and what, how people respond to you, but we can control our own hearts and how we respond to what it is that you want to do in and through us today. So direct us, Father, empower us, enable us, and help us, Father, to be honoring to you in all things I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take and stand together as we worship together this morning. First song that we're going to sing is in Christ alone. You know, your confidence is not in the president. Your confidence is not in each other. Confidence is in Christ, and He will never fail you. Other people will, but Jesus will never fail you. So place your confidence into Christ alone. Maybe a familiar song to you, maybe not. 
It's the first time that Corey and I have done it together and everything. So like I say, things are experimenting a lot of times around here. But regardless of how well the song goes, let it be true of you. I will sing of his love forever. Because that, that is the thing that is really about singing about. What, you might not have a reason to sing today. Today might be a very difficult day for you. You don't know what the day is going to bring. But there's always something you can sing about. There's always something to provide hope. It's Jesus Christ. Let's sing about his love this morning.
had the same vision. And as God developed that vision in them, and as God uh, communicated that vision through them to the church, uh, Don Hartel, the director of missions, uh, got involved. And together with Ola Cox Missions Dollars, the Cherry Grove Baptist Church was founded. And you know what? God laid it on Ted Bennett's heart to be the, the, the pastor there. this, uh, the way I know him best is uh, he was uh, my old change guy. <laughs> yeah, no, he uh, still, does, still has the shop. There were a number of people that tried to start a church. Some of them were Southern Baptist, not too many. Um, it just wasn't the right time yet. It wasn't, I don't look at it as a reflection on their abilities or inabilities or anything. It just wasn't the right time. It, just the way things have worked out at Cherry Grove, it's, it's really been a, a joy work with them. But COVID has, has changed it, you know, just about all of our churches the way they do it. But they haven't missed a beat at, um, at Cherry Grove. They, they started doing online stuff. They had 19 families, new families, that had tuned in to hear that and everything. And of them, uh, the first week after the, that had aired, he had a family of eight that came up and said, we, we prayed to receive Christ by the we like to get baptized. God works wonders. Like you say, uh, with, with the internet, it's amazing that this COVID, this, this virus, uh, it, it, it still got to where it's getting out. I love it. Let me give you a thumbs up. It, it's good. It's good. There are people coming to faith in Christ. There are people being baptized. And that community is being impacted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And friend, if you gave to the Ola Cox State Missions offering, then you're a part of this kind of work. Cherry Grove was like the big target. And I couldn't wait for the Ola Cox money to come in each year. Because I already know from, you know, Ted telling me, you know, I would ask him, I said, well, what do you guys need? And they got a lot of help from work groups outside the state. And God began to bring other sources that could like combine with all the Cox and it would just like augment it. All the Cox would, would put us over the put us over the line, you know? If you think about it as a race. And uh, so, you know, we were able to have chairs when they needed chairs. All the Cox was there. The same thing with the parking lot. You know, I had my friend Tommy he wanted to give money towards the college but enough to cover about half of that. But where the other half come from? I mean, we just still have a sunken parking lot. We use all the Cox money to help fill in there. They have parking lot that they're using. Yeah, I appreciate you all. Please you support your business. And I'm sure I'm going to have to come back in time and get some more support. So, and, uh, but as we grow, we're going to be giving back to all the Cox. We're going to be doing that. May God continue to work through West Virginia Baptist. May God continue to bless us with opportunities to serve him together more than we can on our own. In Potomac Highland Baptist Association as it is in heaven. In Cherry Grove as it is in heaven. May this be our prayer and our goal in West Virginia as it is in heaven. then it goes to support missions here in uh, West Virginia, Maryland, in North America, and around the world. And as a result of the money that, uh, a portion of the money that you give on a weekly basis, it goes to help support other churches that are starting and seeing people come to faith in Jesus Christ, chairs being purchased, all the resources that they need in order to be able to get going and up and running. You're investing in the kingdom. You're not just placing money in an offering plate, you're investing in the kingdom. And so I appreciate your faithfulness in doing those things. I um, want to mention a couple of other things asking for you to participate in as well. Uh, for one, for right now, because of COVID numbers coming back up and everything, we're going to put choir on hold. We announced last week that we're going to try and get that up and running again. We're going to put that on hold for now. We don't want to put anybody in unnecessary danger and such. But on this Wednesday night, uh, we, as we've been doing, we're going to take what we we're talking about on Sunday morning, talk about a little bit further on Wednesday night. But we're going to have to shorten that a little bit on Wednesday 
Because this morning what we're talking about is the good guys during the tribulation. Well, we want to be the good guys now. And we want to influence people toward Jesus Christ now. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and continue our ministry to Kaiser Elementary. And we're going to take goodie bags for all the teachers down there. So Terry will be getting a goodie bag, okay? All right. And uh, so we need some help assembling those on Wednesday night. We've got all the resources we're going to put in the bag. But we've got to get about 90 bags together because that's how many people work down there as far as staff and teachers and such. And uh, so if you'd be able to be able Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, come for Bible study and then stay to be able to help uh, stuff all these goodie bags and everything. We're going to be working on getting a church directory update. You might have seen some new faces around here in the last couple months and everything. Well, those new faces have a hard time learning the names of people. In fact, if some of you have been here a while, you might see that person over there and be like, I recognize them, but I'm kind of, they've told me their name at some point, but I'm kind of embarrassed to go ask their name again. And so we're going to do a church directory update, but this time we're going to try and put pictures with it. Yeah, I saw those books and everything. All right, so they're not professional pictures and everything. It's just, you know, just a from the cell phone or whatever else in order to be able to put that with it and have a, a face to be able to put with a name and uh, try to build up a little bit more uh, companionship and such and names and all those kind of things. We need some new church and nursery, work, uh, nursery workers as well. We're going to try and set up a rotating schedule for junior church. So if you would be available to help with that, would be very helpful there. Tammy's in the nursery every Sunday right now. Um, but... Uh, but she's back there right now. But anyway. David's, what? David's doing it this morning for me. David is doing it this morning. All right. So give him 10 minute break there. So he heard him do it. What, I, what I'm asking of others to be willing to step in and be able to help with that, especially as we have uh, more people in the nursery. You know, if you get two or three little ones in the nursery, you can't do it with one person. Right. We really don't want to have just one person ever yeah. in there. But we need some help with those things. So if you'd be available to help in those areas, uh, see me, and we will get you uh, lined up. I want to mention some thanks to people that helped with some things. I forgot to mention Joan and Larry last week. They painted our nursery, yes. so very appreciative of that. And then Richard came this week, and he put up the lights and the fixtures and everything in there, so got that all up and running. Uh, Janet and Ronnie did some pressure washing on the sidewalks out there. Not this past week, but the week before, wasn't it? Yeah. And there was one more that I needed to mention. Make sure that I get everything taken care of here and such. Get my list. And do, 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 do. I think that was it for now. But, uh, you know, we need to be thankful on a regular basis for the people that are consistent in giving up their talents and their time. Corey, as he leads music, Terry, as she plays, Jim, as he's back there and uh, does the PowerPoints and gets everything running. and tries to take my notes and adjust and all that kind of good stuff and everything. <laughs> so, Sunday school teachers, just, I, the list goes on and on. I am so thankful for you, all of you, and how you participate and how you help, how you pray. What a blessing this church family is. And I'm so very thankful for each one of you. Yes, Ellen? Somebody gave me some money out here when we were working today, and I have misplaced it. So if anybody finds any money kind of crumpled up, would you please see it? I get it. It's for the food box. Okay. Y'all hear that? Okay. Speaking of that, uh, we've got two food boxes back there for two families uh, during uh, Thanksgiving time. So if you'd be so inclined to be able to gather resources to be able to add to those boxes, would greatly appreciate it this morning. We're going to sing once again together, and the song we're going to get ready to do is Faith is the Victory, I think. Yeah, that's it. And you know what? When you look at the stuff, that, <laughs> yes, ma'am? It has been fun. Hallelujah. So very good. Careful. We have to pray about it, so very good. Um, but, you know, you go through life, you do with stuff, health stuff, and financial stuff, and family stuff, and all kind of stuff that comes with. But you don't have to be defeated by those things. Faith in Jesus Christ. Not a wish, not a whim, but a confidence. Faith is the victory. Live in victory. You're going to have victory one day when you go home, but you can have victory right now through Jesus Christ. Let's sing together. You can remain seated for this one. Let us sing about the faith of our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
and for Gene. Uh, wow, part of this church for umpteen. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And uh, so please be in prayer for her. Father, it's Doug. Pray for a friend of mine. He left his motorcycle back in the summer. Okay, but he's only down one car. Okay. So a friend who wrecked motorcycle, but so physically okay, but he's gonna be okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, Chrissy. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to do this about Okay. I just need um you guys just I didn't go pick him up with him, I don't know. But um he told me yesterday that June Today, she's going to pick him up after church and bomb, uh, right? And uh, a barn miracle, um, June Phillips is not going to live you know, much longer and such. And so she's going to be the one passing on the information to him uh, today. So please be in prayer for them and for their family. Anybody else? All right, let's pray together this morning. Father, we come to you. We thank you that we can. We thank you that you are our Father. And as we were reminded of in Sunday school this morning, we are very small and you are very big. But still, even though we wonder why in the world would you want anything to do with us, yet you do. You love on us. You sent your son Jesus to die for us. And Jesus is preparing a home for us now. And we know that some Father will will go to that place, that beautiful, wonderful place before the rest of us do. And we lift up the names of some of those that are in dire uh, physical situations right now. Father, I pray for June Phillips and I pray that you would minister in this life and that you would give peace and that you would give strength. I pray for Christie's husband Shane, even as he is coming home today anticipating uh, being with his family again and yet having this bad news to be able to greet him. What a difficult situation. I pray for Christy. She has to pass along this information that you would give her peace and her strength, I pray. We do pray for Gene Wagner, Father. So loved by the people of this church, but more loved by you than by us. And I pray, Father, that as she has, because of uh, COVID case there at Pine Valley, she to go back into virtual isolation once again. I just pray that you would give her strength. I pray for Jeff as he is struggling. Strengthen him, I pray, dear Father. We pray for the one that Doug mentioned, a friend of his that is struggling both physically and emotionally, going through some difficulties there. For Piney Valley, that you would protect them, Father, and that the COVID would not spread further beyond where it is right now. I pray as well for Ruth and and John Walker this morning as uh, today is their last day as John being the pastor of their church. I pray that you would give them a great encouragement and that you would give them a great send off father and that they would be able to celebrate all that you have done in and through their lives and with the people of this church. What a great blessing he has been to them and what a great blessing it will be to see all the work and the, the results of the work that have been accomplished. Father, accomplish your purposes here today. Do what it is that only you can do. Bring new life. Bring new joy. And bring new obedience, I pray. Thank you, dear Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing one more song here together today before the message. And this song says, yes, yeah, Sandy. Yes. So, um, 
just keep his family in the church. And the church. And my, yeah. That's why my brother Bill will be pastor for a little while today. <clears throat> All right, let's stand together, and we're going to sing this one more song here together this morning. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Let others see Jesus in you. The way that you respond to them in situations of life, good and bad, will manifest the light of Jesus Christ or not. Deneen in Sunday school this morning, she mentioned that, well, pumpkin's gone, but anyway... Um, she talked about the similarity between a pumpkin and a Christian. <laughs> I wasn't sure where she was going at first, but uh, anyway. But one of the things that she said is just as you put a light in a pumpkin and that light shines through the cutouts that you make there and everything, so Jesus is supposed to shine through us to the lives of other people. What kind of, what kind of Jesus are you showing up? Are you letting Jesus shine? Let's think about that this
You may have seen it this morning. You know, I will be very glad when we get back to hymnals. Because at least, if some of you don't read music, some of you do, but at least you can tell when the note is supposed to go up and when it's supposed to go down and all that kind of good stuff and everything. So it makes things a whole lot easier. So we will eventually go back to that. And I hope it's a lot sooner than Dr. Fauci says it's going to be. Whew. Take your Bible open to Revelation chapter 12, if you will, this morning. Revelation chapter 12. We're looking at several passages this morning. But we will begin there. Uh, junior Church, I always forget. I am so sorry, Randy. If you are going to Junior Church, now will be the time that Randy is going to take you this morning. And as I said, if you are willing and able, uh, we need some help in that regard. Uh, to be willing to do it. Just like if you can do one week, it's a month. We're trying to do a rotating schedule and stuff. If you'd be willing, uh, we would really appreciate that. Revelation 7, 12, but I'm going to read verses 7 to 12 together this morning. It says this, And war broke out in heaven. Michael's angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon's angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, as servant of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength of the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the cues of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night have been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, rejoice. Last week, we introduced the evil personalities that were ruled during the tribulation. They are Satan, pictured as a dragon in the book of Revelation, the beast, better known as the Antichrist, and another beast that John envisioned as a two-horned lamb, and who is later identified in the book of Revelation as the false prophet. These three will come as a, as a bad substitute for God. They will operate under the pretense and the promise of bringing peace to the earth, but all who follow them will wind up in the same category as they do, destroyed, cast into the lake of fire forever. What these three bring, coupled with the destruction that happened because of God's judgment on the earth, will wreck the planet and kill billions of people. Those seven years will be the worst seven years that planet earth has ever seen. 2020 will pale in comparison to that time frame. Today is November 1st. We are nearing the end of the year. Is anybody happy that 2020 is almost over? Amen. Sadly, that does not guarantee that 2021 will be any better. <laughs> we'll see. But... This year has definitely been a year to remember, and some of you would say this has been a year to forget. It has been an interesting year, uh, regardless of what you think about it. Uh, approaching the end of the year always leads to some reflection. And as I was thinking about this year, this week, I thought about what some of the, the largest stories of the year uh, would, you know, what how that would work out, you know, where they would fit in that order. So obviously, the biggest story of 2020 is what? COVID. You know, all the, it and all the suffering, the change of life that it has brought. Um, I guess it was Bill that was asking me Friday night, did you ever think that you would walk into a restaurant and everybody would be wearing a mask? And I thought, no, I you know, never considered that as, as a reality. But if, if you think, okay, so obviously that's the biggest story of the year. In my personal opinion, you can debate this and everything. The second biggest story of the year is either what's getting ready to happen next Tuesday, where we elect our next president for the next four years, or is what happened on May 25th of this year, the things that happened after that with George Floyd's death and the, the turmoil that that has created. Um, in our country and around the world. Me personally, I kind of think that all those stories, COVID, politics, 
and George Floyd, that those are all tightly interconnected with each other. They, you can't separate them out because they all played in together. In the last six months, we have seen some of the worst that our society has to offer. Um, some deaths caused by police that started riots all over, you know, all over the United States as well as around the world. Attacks on police by those rioters as well as politicians along the way. People inside Walmart that argued with each other and fought with each other over things like hand sanitizer, toilet paper, and how many packs of meat they can buy. Uh, once thriving businesses, uh, now defunct, either because of the shutdown itself or because of um, the looting that came after that. And of course, then you, with all those businesses shut down, you have uh, dramatic unemployment that happened as a result of that. Yeah. Along that line, everybody's laying the blame at somebody else's feet. You know, nobody's willing to take blame for whatever it is that's happened. They, they just like to you know, throw the blame on other people. We talked about in Sunday school this morning a simple person. How would you like to go back to simpler days? Anybody like to go back to simpler days? <laughs> Uh, it would be nice if the biggest concern that we had, you know, was what we were going to eat for breakfast as opposed to, you know, whether we're going to have a job or, or whether, you know, riots are going to happen or whatever else it might be. If we ever needed some of the heroes of the past, now would be the time. Uh, I grew up, as I said, down in the Atlanta area. TBS, you know, was free to everybody at the time and everything. So I grew up with some, some heroes. You remember Lone Ranger and Tonto? Mm -hmm. I mean, I love that series because in 30 minutes, the bad guy was defeated, everything was set right, you know, they, 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 they won against the bad guy and made sure that his evil did not reach any further than it had at that point. Man, I think we need some people like that today. Maybe even some people like Andy Griffith and Ward Cleaver and Jim Anderson with their small town fatherly wisdom. Maybe people like, uh, even like MacGyver. Remember MacGyver? Yep. You know, with his knowledge and his ingenuity, his pers perseverance, and his indomitable spirit, you know, I'm just going to keep on moving forward. Maybe even Gomer Pyle, with his <laughs> naivety and friendliness. Simpler days. Though these characters were fictional, when you really think about it, if you look at what's happened in 2020, that looks pretty fictional too, if we weren't really living through it. But these fictional characters spoke of a time in our history where life is far more sane than it is today. What, do you, what, what suggestions do you think these men would have for how to fix things in our society? If these men, in their fictional roles, were to look at our society today, what do you think they would have to say about our society? I pray that history judges us mercifully. Hopefully, along with the chaos, uh, history will also record the stories of some of the heroes of our year. Because there are a lot of heroes that came out of some very unlikely places in 2020. Doctors and nurses who held the hands of dying people in the hospital because their families were unable to be there with them. Truck drivers who because the restaurants and the, and the, the uh, travel plazas were shut down, had to drive long miles without a meal, in some cases without an ability to even go to the restroom, to be able to get their resources to the places where those resources were needed. Police officers and firemen who refused to surrender to the attacks of a few and chose rather to serve and protect even though they themselves were under attack. Teachers and parents who quickly learn new skills and who have refused to succumb to the difficulties that our current scenario puts on them. And then there's all those essential workers that knew that by serving the public, they were putting themselves and their families in danger, but they stayed at their job in order to be able to serve us. The list could go on and on. There are always a few good people who rise above the evil of their environment to show us that we can too. 
that we can rise about what it, what it is that's going on. The people that choose to do the right thing, regardless of the cost that come along with that. This morning, I want to introduce you to three sets of people who choose to do the right thing, even in the middle of the worst possible scenario that the planet Earth has ever seen. Three sets of people who choose to be the good guys in the middle of the tribulation. Our goal here is a simple one this morning. What I want to do is as I, as I introduce these individuals to you, or as I remind you of them, whichever the case may be, my goal is to motivate you to be the person who stands up for right in our time against the evil that we deal with now. You won't be here during the tribulation. If my understanding of the scripture is correct, you won't be here. You won't be one of these individuals that we're going to talk about today. They'll deal with their evil. We have our own evil to deal with. They will stand up for right when right is costly. As we look at their example, one of the things that you do when, when you see somebody standing up and being a hero, standing up for what is right in difficult times, it helps to motivate you to do the same. And so that's my goal here this morning. As if we see these individuals that stand up for right in evil times, that it will motivate us to take up that mantle for ourselves during our time. So let's get started. The first set of good guys during the tribulation is a pair of prophets simply known as God's two witnesses. The Bible speaks of them in Revelation chapter 11. It says, And I'll give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Two unnamed individuals will prophesy during the first half of the tribulation. We don't, we're not told the content of their message, but we are going to clue. And the clue is the clothing that they wear. They're wearing sackcloth. And that would be a normal thing for prophets in the Old Testament to wear because they had a very negative message. It was a message of, guys, you're doing the wrong thing. You need to repent. You need to come back to God. And so it's likely that their message is going to be one of repentance and warning of the impending judgment of God that is coming on planet Earth. They will likely warn to of the Antichrist and work to thwart the deception that he and the false prophet are trying to work um, and bring on the world. They will work to turn people to God. And to validate their message, if we were to read further in this passage, it talks about some of the powers that these, these will have. They will have unlimited destructive power. Fire comes out of their mouths to be able to, to destroy whoever it is that is, is working to hurt them. They'll be able to call down plagues, stop the rain. And, and bring about great destruction on planet Earth. Based on the similarity between what these men can do and what the actions of the Old Testament prophet Elijah, some have suggested that this is Elijah returned back from heaven. I, I don't know. The Bible doesn't identify who these individuals are. However, just as Elijah's nemesis, King Ahab, laid the blame for what was going on at Elijah's feet rather than accepting the blame for himself, the same will be true at this time. The Antichrist will, the, the, the evil, the, the suffering that is going on, the Antichrist will lay the blame at the, the feet of these two witnesses rather than taking blame, the blame for himself. He will label these good men as evil. The prophet Isaiah spoke of a time when people will call evil Good, and good, evil. Folks, we're there. Oftentimes, though, even for us as individuals, for us as Christians, as, as, as us as people of the book, that we usually define evil and good based on how it affects us. God doesn't think the way that we think. For God, evil and good are fixed points. They're not determined by the person, the situation, the scenario. It does not matter how unholy Trinity feels about these two witnesses. God considers them to be good. There will be a nuisance from the Antichrist, though, and the rebellious people of time, much like today, a, if, if there's somebody in a, in a corporation or in a governmental entity that's a whistleblower, 
They, 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 they're a nuisance. They're, they're trying to stop the negative things that are going on. And so those that are in those places try to work against them. So, but these witnesses, they can speak without fear of reprisal because God gives them some supernatural abilities. As I said, fire comes out of their mouths. Now, I've seen some news conferences where, where you know, fiery words are coming. But can you imagine if, if you had the power to be able to destroy the people that were opposing you with fire coming out of your mouth? I would talk about these things sometimes with my students when I was a teacher. And I often imagined, and I can even say it to them sometimes, what if fire could come out of the teacher's mouth and destroy the student that's being rebellious? That probably might not go over so well, but respect for the teacher would happen pretty quickly. Things can change very quickly. As much as the Antichrist wants to kill these two nuisances, he will be unable to do so because of the protection that God places on their lives. However, once their mission is complete, God will remove his hand of protection. After many unsuccessful attempts, the beast will finally kill these two men of God. It speaks of that in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 7. Imagine the celebration. Here's, here's these two guys that have been fighting against Antichrist. He's been trying to kill them for three and a half years, unsuccessful. The level of frustration that he's going to feel must be massive. And then all of a sudden, for some unknown reason to him, he's able to destroy them. Imagine the celebration. You can get a feel for it by considering this. Imagine how Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer will, will react if Donald Trump is not reelected. I understood then. Imagine, on the other hand, how he will react if the two of them lose their re-election re bid. So on this day, when the Antichrist is able to finally kill those two witnesses, there will be a great celebration. In fact, that future beast will rejoice over his victory, so much so that he will refuse burial to these two men, and their bodies will lie in the street of Jerusalem for three and a half days. The Bible even says, go into the next one there, Jim. The Bible even says that they will celebrate on the earth. They will make merry. They will send gifts to one another. Last week we looked at the um, Antichrist and he that he apparently dies or at least fakes his death and then comes back from the dead. He fakes a resurrection. He fakes Easter. Counterfeit Easter. Now we have a counterfeit Christmas. Because people are sending gifts to one another in celebration that these two witnesses have been successfully killed. Three and a half days later, though, guess what happens? They rise from the dead. God raises them back, to, those witnesses back to life, calls them directly up to heaven, and they go home. The verse is finished with talking about an earthquake that will happen when 7,000 people will die and a tenth of the city of Jerusalem will be destroyed. These verses basically, you know, some verses in the book of Revelation are very hard to interpret. These are not. These are pretty self-explanatory. They're shocking, but they're pretty self-explanatory. But as I was studying them this week, and as I've told you even as we're going through this series, my heart is always not just to give you information, but to say, what does this have to do with me? How does this impact my life now? And so I asked a question. The question came into my mind, a persistent, puzzling question that just was just one more instance of. Why does God allow the death of these witnesses? Why does God allow the good guys to die? Couldn't God have just raptured them out when their mission was complete and saved them this pain like he did for Enoch and Elijah? God had done it before. Why did he allow these to go through, through suffering. I have a possible reason for that. Let me walk through a scenario with you and consider if this might actually fit. Right now, there is a lot of information censorship that is happening. Can I get an amen? Mm -hmm. It's happening. Consider what the information censorship will be like during that time. Knowing what is happening now, the false prophet will not only have technological ability, but he'll have some spiritual abilities going along with that as well. Imagine the level of information censorship that he will maintain. He will stifle any information 
that would be damaging to the Antichrist and in his agenda of being able to go gain world domination. He doesn't want anything out there that would make the Antichrist to appear weak. He wants people to follow after the Antichrist. He wants the Antichrist to have world domination. And so he's going to clamp down on any information that would cause people to question the leadership ability of the Antichrist. So one of the things that he will clamp down on is this information about these two witnesses. They'll be in Jerusalem. People in Jerusalem, I would imagine, will know about what's going on. But because of this information censorship, quite likely the rest of the world will be clueless about what is happening. So the final battle between the Antichrist and these two witnesses might be the very first time that the majority of the world finds out about these two guys. I can imagine a scenario that goes something like this. As the Antichrist seems to be gaining the victory, it's then that the false prophet opens up some of the avenues for information. He invites the networks to come in and see what it is that's going on and, and record and, and view what it is that's going on. The Bible says that all the world will see the events that are transpiring here. The only way for them to be able to do that technologically would be all these news cameras that are, that are focusing on the events that are going on. You can hear the news anchor saying something like this. We enter on the broadcast for a special news bulletin. We're cutting live to Jerusalem right now. And as they do so, they see the Antichrist in his final battle against these two witnesses and are able finally to be able to kill them. And they're going to carry the story live. Though the networks either did not see or ignored what led up to that battle, their camels were rolling when the two witnesses died. The viewing audience will grow exponentially. As, they, as it, uh, uh, it becomes viral in all the different news avenues that are available to them. Even after the defeat of these two witnesses, webcams and news reports will still continue to be trained on the bodies of these men lying dead in the street. They will see the Antichrist victory. Three and a half days later, though, those same cameras will broadcast and record the witnesses' resurrection, the voice from heaven, and their ascension back up into heaven. By, these, by that point, these men will have lived three and a half years and have been dead for three and a half days. I ask you a question. Which one, the three and a half years of ministry or the three and a half days of death, which one of those two will have the greater impact on the world? Three and a half days of death. In that light, consider what Jesus said concerning another death, that of his friend Lazarus. Go ahead and go to the next slide there, Jim. It's not there. It's not there. It's not there. Then I'll say it for you. John chapter 11, verse 4 says this This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified. You see what Jesus said concerning Lazarus? He said, the reason that I've allowed my friend to die, the, elite, the reason that I've allowed my friend to go through this pain, through this suffering, it's not because I want to inflict pain on him, but because the pain that I'm allowing him to go through will bring me glory. And that through that pain, people will come to faith in Jesus Christ. The same thing will happen for these two witnesses. Only this time, you know how big of an audience there will be? It will be a worldwide audience. The same people who witnessed the defeat of God's men will also see the victory. But the witnesses could not have a miraculous victory unless they first had a crushing defeat. So, question. Has there ever been a time in your life when it looked like the enemy had won? A time when you felt like God had abandoned you? A time when you tearfully questioned God about why he was allowing you to hurt so much. James says to kind of all joy when you go through various trials. Now the reason that he uses in that passage is because when you go through trials, it, it will develop your patience, it will develop your character. But an equally valid reason to kind of all joy when you go through various trials is because those trials give you an opportunity to shine Jesus through your life. To show 
the sustaining power of Jesus in the middle of the circumstance that you go through. A few moments ago, we sang this song. Let others see Jesus in you. You speak about your great God to other people. And they ignore you. Or they don't want to hear it. And you ask the question, how can I get through to them? Let your pain be your megaphone. See, people will most clearly hear your message when it is spoken through tears. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that you just have a brave face every time that you go through difficulties or that you lie every time somebody says, how you doing? And you say, I'm fine. fine. That's not what I'm suggesting to you. Be real. Because only a real Christian can, send, can let Jesus show through their lives. Show your pain. Express your sorrow. Yell your questions. But make sure you always follow that up with, but God, your statement of faith. You know the story of Job. Job, while facing horrific emotional and physical suffering, and after he, expressing his disappointment with God, his anger at God, his agitation at God, he still said the following in Job chapter 19. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he will stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I will see God. Paul, after going to before the Father and saying, Lord, can't you please remove this thorn in the flesh from me? I, I, I'm, I'm pleading with you. Will you please remove me? And God said, No. To which Paul responded, most gladly I will rather boast of my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. These two witnesses will go through pain. They will go through hardship. But their witness will be magnified all that much more because they were faithful to Jesus Christ. Heroes do not always escape pain. But heroes always trust God in the midst of it and do what is right even when they are in. The first good group guy stifled the evildoers in their evil society. The second group of good guys will maintain their purity in a... Go on the next one there, Jim, if you would. Keep going. And what? There we go. All right. The second group of good guys will maintain their purity in a corrupt, immoral society. Let's look at these passages here. Revelation chapter 7 to begin with. There we go. And then I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God. And I heard the number of those who were shielded, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Go to the next one. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. These are the ones who were not defiled with women for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. And their mouth was found no deceit for they are without fault before the throne of God. That second set of verses that we just looked at communicate some characteristic that these 144,000 Jews will possess. First, these men will be morally pure. Moral purity is difficult to maintain in our current society. And right now, because we're here, because the church is here, we hold back the moral degradation of our society. At that point, when this is going on, the church is going to be gone. Evil will run rampant. Can you imagine how much more difficult it will be then for people to maintain moral purity? But these guys will. Second, it says that they will be courageously and consistently obedient. It says they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Though following Jesus will not be popular, though following Jesus will be even more costly than it is now. Though following Jesus will mean going places and doing things that produce no immediate benefit they still will follow Jesus. Third scripture says to them that they speak truth. There's no deceit in these men. Speaking truth in a world where truth has very little value can often get you into some trouble. And much more so then because the Antichrist will not be a source of truth but be empowered by Satan who Jesus said is the father of lies. But they will still speak truth. Morally pure, consistently obedient, speakers of truth. 
This is the nature of these men. And from what I can see, that was their nature before Jesus put his hand of protection on these men. They were doing the right thing even before God sent them out as missionaries into the world that he wanted to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I got a question. I had to, had to ask this question of myself this week. If these men can be more mature, consistently obedient, and consistently speak the truth in their society, what excuse have I got for not living that same kind of way in my society? When evil will be far more rampant then than it is now. Because these are clean, God can use them in dramatic ways, and he does. The second group of good guys will be a, a, a composed of the largest missionary force that there has ever been. They are 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. The Jews will finally recognize Jesus as their Messiah and spread his message all over the world. On this past Wednesday night, as we were talking about uh, some of these things and some of the things that we dealt with last Sunday morning, I mentioned to the group at that time that one of the focuses of the tribulation will be on the Jewish people. God loves the Jewish people. He loves us too, but he loves the Jewish people and he wants to bring them back into a relationship with himself. And he will use that time to reach the Jewish people. The 144,000 will be the first part of that harvest that will come about as a result of that. And something special will happen to these guys. To increase the overall harvest of souls, God puts his seal on the 144,000. Like the beast, God uh, places his mark on those that he claims as his own and those who submit to him, and he places it in the same place on their foreheads. This mark is something special, and it causes the, the people to be able to these men to be able to be victorious, it causes them to not to be able to, to, to uh, have to deal with the judgments of God or the attacks of the Antichrist. You know what? If you are a Christian, you have a seal of God on your life too. Go to the next one there, Jimmy's Wood. It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. If you're a Christian, you've been sealed as well. This seal is God's statement of ownership. It says to those who would mess with you, particularly those spiritual forces that would mess with you, don't mess with my child. They belong to me. That seal also guarantees a safe arrival at your eventual destination. You can live for Jesus with confidence, knowing who you belong to and what he's promised. Think of a seal in this terms. Uh, Jan, you can lots some vegetables. Last thing you do, I imagine, is you put that seal on there, a little bit of vacuum pressure and everything. Why? Because you want to protect the inside. Jeff, that's not Jeff, but Jeff looks at normally over there and everything. Uh, Jeff, when he get, you know, gets that deer and cuts it all up and everything, he seals it in that vacuum seal before he puts it in the freezer. Sandy, if she sends off the bills every month in order to pay the expenses of the church, she seals that envelope in order to make sure that what's inside gets her to its intended destination. You can see. There is nothing that the enemy can do to prevent you from safely getting to your destination. Like us, God will seal these 144,000 Jews to protect them during the tribulation. Unlike our protection, though, their protection goes a little bit further. We're protected spiritually. They're protected spiritually and physically such that the things that happen during the tribulation, the disease, the famine, the judgments of God, the attacks of the Antichrist, can't affect them. It may even be possible that during the tribulation they can't even die. Question is why? Why does God do this? Because they have a mission. And their mission is to share the gospel with as many people as they possibly can and God doesn't want anything to get in the way to impede that task that he has given them to do. God wants them to fulfill their mission. And fulfill their mission, they do. It is a huge success. The passage speaks of these 144,000 being sealed. That passage ends with John envisioning a vast horde of people. He says, and after these things I look, and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne, before the land, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands. 
That gets us to the third group of good guys during the tribulation. Christians, overcomers. Though it is not emphatically stated, the insinuation is given that that vast horde that we see in that passage is as a result of the witness of the 144,000 Jews. Long before the tribulation began, Jesus testified that before the end came, the gospel was going to go out into all the world. That will happen. God will use many means to accomplish that mission. God's evangelistic efforts to win the tribulation world begin soon after the rapture takes place with the two witnesses. Did you notice the similarities between what was said about the two witnesses and the life of Jesus? How long was their ministry? Three and a half years. Their life, their death, their resurrection, their ascension. I think God does that intentionally. I think the reason that he does that is so that if somebody is viewing that on their tablet or on their smart TV or whatever it is that they'll be viewing things on at that time, as they view that set of circumstances, they say, hey, that sounds familiar. It reminds me of a story that my grandmother used to tell me way back years ago about a man named Jesus. Along with those two prophets who warn God's pe uh, people of God's impending judgment, God also uses the 144,000 Jews. He puts a shield of protection on them so that nothing will hinder their, their message. And he said, that's not enough. God sends even an angel. It says, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having an everlasting gospel preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. God sends two witnesses. He sends 144,000 Jews. He sends an angel to declare the gospel. When you study the book of Revelation, or think about the end times, it's very easy to get focused on the judgment of God that happens during this time. But as you look at those times and as you look through the book of Revelation, don't fail to see something else. God's mercy. Because even as God is pouring out his judgment on mankind, he is sending all these different individuals to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ to these people. You might just get the idea that God would rather rescue people than condemn them. Look at Revelation chapter 12. It says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation is strength from the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down and they overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Christians, people who come to faith in Jesus Christ during the tribulation. I tend to think that these believers will be different from your average Western Christian today. I tend to think they'll be more like the Christians that live in North Korea right now, or China, or some of the Muslim countries. People who have endured intense persecution for their faith. They have no illusions about what their relationship will cost them. They recognize that they're fighting a battle. They're in a war. They're not looking for comfort or ease. They are warriors fighting for the, for the king, willing to die to rescue others from the fate which they were destined for. They don't fight with guns. Did you catch their weapons? They fight with the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. These are weapons that the enemy cannot understand, nor can he defeat. And they are powerful. Unlike the two witnesses, unlike 144,000, these Christians can die. They can die easily. But they cannot be defeated. They will overcome. Not through supernatural powers, not through supernatural protection, but through faith and the perseverance that that faith produces. We sang another song this morning. Faith is the victory that does what? Overcomes the world. These are people for whom compromise is not an option. The enemy will use whatever tactics he can to get them to deny their faith. Hunger, thirst, torture, intimidation, separation from family.
But still, they will remain faithful. It makes me wonder when I consider what these will go through, how I would react if persecution came to Western Maryland and West Virginia. If somebody put a gun to my head and said, said deny Jesus Christ or die, I think I have a pretty good idea about how I would respond to that. Send me home. I'm ready to go. But what if instead they put that situation to me and told me deny Christ as I'm listening to my wife scream or my daughter or my son? What would make it even more difficult is if they threatened or were doing harm to my grandchildren, especially if by that point one of my grandchildren had not received Christ as Savior yet. Folks, regardless of the cost, Jesus comes first. While I do not wish to diminish the importance of family, it cannot take preeminence over our commitment to God. I've not been here long, but I've already heard somebody say these words. Well, I can't come to church because that's my only day to be able to spend with my family. Now, I'm not trying to say that attendance at church is necessary for salvation or that it's even the biggest uh, indicator of where you are with Jesus Christ. But, I will say this, it's the most visible indicator. And it's awfully difficult to argue your commitment to Jesus Christ if you're not willing to be in church and fellowship with his people when you are physically able to do so. The God who said, you shall have no other gods before me, did not exempt family as a viable option for him. These future saints will pay the ultimate cost. Most of them will die as martyrs during the tribulation. What cost are you willing to pay to stand up for Jesus Christ and stand for what is right in an evil time. The Jesus followers during the tribulation will grow from 2 to 144,000 to a vast horde of followers. All this happens in the worst conditions the world has ever seen, physically, financially, spiritually, emotionally. Sounds to me almost like the uh, growth curve of the early church all over again. There will be good guys, heroes, who live and minister during a time of unparalleled evil. I told you that my goal for today was as we look at these individuals and these groups, my goal is to convince you to stand up against evil in your society as well. We need good guys today who will not allow evil to be the thing that pushes forward, but that we will push back evil. But perhaps today... Maybe you have trouble identifying with some of the people that we've talked about. I hear you. It's difficult for me to identify with some of them as well. Maybe you would make the excuse, well, I'd stand up against evil too if fire could come out of my mouth and destroy people who were standing against me. But it can't. I'd stand up against evil too if I had a shield of protection around me and I could guarantee a successful ministry and I didn't have to stand alone but I could be part of a large group. But I can't. Those things aren't true of us. In fact, it may not even be fair of me to hold those two groups up as examples. So, let's just focus on the last group. They will be everyday Jesus followers. No superhuman powers no supernatural protection, but a choose to faithful following of Jesus regardless of the cost. They follow in a long line of faithful believers. History tells us of a man named Paul Carp, a pupil of John the Apostle. As an old man, the, Rock, the Romans offered him a choice. They said, you're, you know, you're almost 90 years old. We don't want to do harm to you. We'll give you mercy if you'll just deny Jesus. We know you don't mean it. Just say the words. The other option is if you continue to hold on to Jesus, we will burn you alive. Burn you at the stake. Look at this quote from that man. Eighty and six years have I served Christ, 
and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? You threaten the fire that burns for an hour and then is quenched. But you know not of the fire of the judgment to come and the fire of the eternal punishment. Bring what you will. And he died by being burned to death. But he had a great testimony. He stood up for Jesus Christ. Now, he was just a normal, average, everyday Christian. But he had a faithful ministry. I can identify with a person like that. Some of you may know people like that. Many of you know John Ruth Walker. Today is his last day as pastor. He has faithfully served for 38 years in the same church. I sat down and talked with him a few weeks ago. And that talking with him, chatting about what he's doing next, got me to thinking a little bit. Where will I want to be when I finish up my ministry here? You, you may think that that's a little bit early to think about. It. I've only been here a year. But if I want to be 20 to 25 years from now, if I want to be in the, in the place of finishing well, I need to be thinking about what would I like my ministry to look like as we go along. Joe got me thinking that direction too. A couple of weeks ago, we were standing out here in the dumpster and just chatting away. And he said these words to me. He said, uh, Pastor... I pray for you, your family, my church, and your ministry every night. He's told me that many times. Then he asked me this question. He said, what would it look like for you to finish well? I started thinking about that. You know, I, I, sometimes I get these grandiose ideas, these grandiose dreams of um, I was winning so many people to Jesus Christ that we have to either have to add to this building or build, or build a bigger building because we've won lots of people to Jesus. I want to see the baptistry behind this screen being used on a regular basis. I want to see the people that get saved, discipled in their faith and taking up ministry roles in this church. I want to see pastors and missionaries growing up in this church and going out to serve in other churches. I want to see us start in other churches. I want to see... Adults and teenagers go out on mission teams to, close, to places that are nearby and countries that are far away. That's how most pastors would define success. But then I started thinking about what is God's perspective on success? He tells us actually faithfulness. Faithfully doing what God has called us to do regardless of the situation. John and, Walker, John and Ruth Walker are an example of that. Polycarp was an example of that. These men we have talked about this morning will be an example of that. I want to be found faithful. Don't you? As you indicated, most of you have already voted. Come Tuesday, or thereafter, it may be. We're going to find out who our next president is going to be for the next four years. Let's say that potentially the person that is inaugurated in January 2021 is not the guy that you want and not the guy that you voted for. You might at that point have some similarity with the people in the, in the end times that uh, fight against the Antichrist and uh, seek to do harm to him. Not that I'm suggesting you should, but you might understand the thinking that, they're, that they have at that point. You might even think, man, the person that's in the, in the Oval Office is evil and his agenda is evil. And, and my, I might as well just leave the country behind and go somewhere else. But then you realize that whatever happens here is going to make it somewhere else as well. Oh, even so, whatever happens here has probably happened to those other places as well. So you choose to stay. Evil's coming, folks. Regardless of whether we're talking about the next four years, or the next 20 years, or the next 100 years, evil is here. And it's only going to get worse. Who will be the people that stand up against that evil? Every generation has their people that stand up and do what was right. You remember Esther 4.14? Esther was there for what? For such a time as this. You will not be here during the tribulation. Those men 
will not live during our time. They'll impact their time. Who's going to impact this time? Who will it be? Will it be you? Will you stand up against evil? Will you stand for right? Regardless of the cost, regardless of the situation. Two witnesses, 144,000, a vast horde of Christians living in an evil time. What's your excuse for bowing down to evil? You have God's Holy Spirit living inside of you. Take advantage of what He wants to do in your life. Do not allow evil to live. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we bow before you. We thank you so much for our salvation. We thank you for the testimony of people in our past and people in our future who will stand up against evil and will say, hey, you can do what you will, but I know who wins, and I'm on his side. Father, I pray that we will choose to stand up against evil. We don't know what's coming, but you do. And I pray, Father, that we will live in confidence, knowing we've been sealed by God's Holy Spirit. That doesn't guarantee us physical protection, but it guarantees us that we go home. When all is said and done, we go home. Help us, Father, to stand up for what is right, to do what is right, and to live according to the example that your Son, Jesus Christ, laid down for us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a hymn of meditation. We'll turn your eyes upon Jesus. Maybe you can't see what the future holds. Maybe you're going to be dealing with some difficult things in the days ahead or even in the moments ahead. Look into the, into the face of Jesus Christ. He can give you the strength to do what is right, even when others do it wrong. Let's sing together.
strength, Lord God, for all of us, Lord, as we yeah. enter a critical time in, in our lives and in this country and in this world, Lord God. Let's always look towards you in all things, Lord. Thank you for the service and this time together, Lord. Lord, as you commanded, Father, that we can worship you, Father, and we can gather together with you. We pray for safe trips and journeys, Father, as we go home, Lord God. But this is not the only place, Lord God, where we worship. Help us, Father, all this week, Lord God, to be uh, to be uh, worshipful, Father, and seeking you out in all things, Father. Give us the strength to overcome, to be overcomers, Lord God. We desperately need you in these times. We give you glory and honor, Father, today and forever, Father.